Let's turn together one more time to the prophet Hosea, chapter 11. We're studying through this prophet, reading and making some comments. He was contemporary with Isaiah and prophesied to the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of the north. And he's pronouncing the Lord's word of condemnation upon them as a whole because of their idolatry. They were wholly given over to idolatry from the beginning. And we're now some 200 years into the existence of those 10 tribes of the north, whereby when the kingdom split, Jeroboam's servant took 10 tribes, the majority. A lot of people think that truth is with majority. Well, it's not necessarily so. There were 10 of the 12 tribes that went after that first king, Jeroboam. And 200 years later, they're still following in his footsteps. And yet the Lord reminds through Hosea here how merciful he had been to them, that there wasn't any reason that they should ever leave the Lord other than the depravity of their own heart. And he reminds them, it says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. God reminds these 10 tribes of his tenderness and kindness toward them more than 500 years before this time that they had been delivered out of Egypt. And here the Lord refers to them as his son. It's just like all of the sons of men are God's sons by creation, not by redemption, but by creation. And he's reminding them of just how merciful he had been. Of course, this is an unexpected prophecy here that was fulfilled actually in the life of the Lord Jesus. If you go over to Matthew chapter two and verse 15, it shows how this particular verse where the Lord said out of Egypt, I called my son, they were actually fulfilled when Jesus was taken as a child down into Egypt to protect him from Herod's sword against all of those children, two years and younger. That was not how the Lord Jesus was to die. And so the Lord took him and his family back down into Egypt until the threat was passed and then brought them out again. And that's a type and picture of our Lord Jesus Christ being in bondage under this world and under this curse. He came into this world. He wasn't partaker of it, but he was made of a woman, made under the law that he might what redeem, just like Israel typically was redeemed by that Passover lamb. Christ is that Passover lamb. So it was necessary that he be called out of Egypt. And this is what Matthew chapter 2 and verse 15 refers to. And it says, as they called them, so they went from them. And they sacrificed unto Baalim, that's the plural for Baals, and burned incense to graven images. So even the Lord, though the Lord had showed mercy in bringing them out of Egypt, yet in coming out, they did not follow the Lord. In fact, they forsook the Lord and followed the Baal. In other words, the local deities of Canaan. And such would be the case of any one of us, that even knowing how it is that God has purposed to redeem his people, yet unless the spirit of the Lord reveals Christ in the heart, we would follow after all of the other gods of this world. Many today give lip service to this God of the Bible and yet don't know him. But the Lord speaks here with tenderness. In other words, if men are condemned, it's not for lack of tenderness and mercy on the part of God himself, but due to their own sin. He said, I taught Ephraim also to go taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. Here the expression is that of the Lord dealing much as a parent would with a child, taking them by their arms and leading them. Just like a little child 
does not have a full appreciation of just who that parent is to that child. And many times you can show tenderness and kindness to your own children, but that's no guarantee that they're going to be raised up to be the Lord's. And yet you show them that kindness, you lead them, even as here the Lord refers to Ephraim, which was, again, a, another synonym for those ten tribes of the north. And he says, I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love. That's an interesting expression there, cords of a man. It speaks of how the Lord led this people, even in their rebellion, much as he's doing today in our nation and other nations, in his mercy, in his providence, directing all people. And yet, that is not what wins them over. That is not what causes their heart to be turned to him. And yet, in that tenderness, by rebelling against the Lord, they only prove all the more his reason for judgment. But the word here, bands of love, or I drew them with cords of a man, it's an interesting word in the original. It means leading strings. You say leading strings. Well, we've all seen some people where they're trying to teach their child to walk, and they actually have them on a little leash, and as the child follows along on that leash, the parent is actually helping that child step by step to learn to walk. And that's the word that's used here, how the Lord taught these to walk, even as a little child. And I was to them as they that took off the yoke on their jaws, and I laid unto them. To take off the yoke is a, a symbol of relaxing or loosening the collar of the yoke on a plowing animal, giving the animal time to be able to rest and to refresh himself. And the Lord uses that in its, as an example. In other words, there's no reason for these to rebel against the Lord because he's never overbearing in his providence. Were he to judge men according to their ways and their iniquity, then uh, they, they couldn't stand. So it's a reminder how even the Lord with the unconverted in his providence is merciful. Anything this side of hell is, is merciful. So that in the end, there's none that can say of the Lord, well, you are the one that led me the way you did, and therefore I am what I am. No, each sinner must take account of their own sin because there's nothing in God and his kindness and mercy that would ever cause a sinner to rebel as he does other than the sin of their own nature. So this is where we begin to see now, as Hosea's reminding them, a lot of people like to blame God and find fault with him for his judgments. But Hosea begins here to show the tenderness of God in creation and providence with sinners. And in his mercy, even a breath in his world is, is merciful. Anything this side of hell is mercy. Now the Lord begins to show how He's going to apply not his strict hand toward Israel. You want to, you think God's harsh in how he deals tenderly day in, day out? Well, the Lord says, all right, I'll bring my hand of justice upon you. And what is it that he chastises? Why is it that he brings judgment upon people? It's because of their own false profession. Verse 5, he shall not return on the land of Egypt. But the Assyrian king shall be, the Assyrian shall be his king. Remember, this is what we're seeing in the kings. In the last chapter we, we studied, the Lord raised up that Syrian, Assyrian king now and brought in and, and took out the ten tribes of Israel. So don't be looking back to Egypt as if you can go back there. No, the, the Assyrian shall be his king. Why? Because they refuse to return. That word return means repent. Man left to himself would never repent, never turn toward God, only be hardened. And he says, the sword shall abide on his cities and shall consume his branches and devour them because of their what? own counsels. I hear people argue all the time saying, well, it's not fair because God 
chose some for salvation, but the rest he left to themselves. But that's the exact thing they want. They want to be able to have their determination, their will. And this is what happens when the Lord leaves sinners to their own counsels. These that say they believe in free will and in God leaves man up to his will, there's no good in there. It's only judgment and condemnation, even as we see here. But he said, my people are bent to backsliding from me. Turn a sinner loose. That sinner is never going to go forward to Christ. That sinner is only going to backslide like a slippery, slidey slope. That's what this depraved nature does. It, none can come to Christ except they be drawn by the Father. And when he leaves men to their own devices, that's what they do. Though they called them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. That's the call of the gospel, even as it's preached right now. Different ones hear it, but unless the Spirit of God is pleased to do a work in the heart and draw sinners to Christ, they'll only become harder. Therefore, God is just in his condemnations. You notice there it says they did not exalt him with their lives. They did not exalt him. That's the problem today. People have a God that they look upon as their companion or their, their friend, but who are those that truly exalt the Most High? Give Him glory in all things, creation and providence and salvation, and yes, even in condemnation, without an argument. But here we see how the Lord was even being merciful in how He chastened them and that He did not completely wipe them out immediately so that none could say, well, He just cleaned the table. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I, shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboim? My heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. This is human language. So that we see here that God in his judgments is not just some austere God that loves to destroy sinners and laugh about it when he doesn't. This is speaking here of God's heart when he says, my repentings are kindled together. In other words, my sympathy is stirred. It's like a judge that, that must, according the law, render his judgment to satisfy the law. And yet within the heart of that judge, there's, there's that desire to be merciful. When it says here, how shall I make thee is Adma, and how shall I set thee as a bone? These were two cities that were in proximity with Sodom and Gomorrah. That when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, these cities that were in proximity were also destroyed. And so the Lord is speaking here out of compassion in his dealings with the 10 tribes of the north of Israel. That it's not that he would desire to have them destroyed, and yet in his justice he must. And they will be like these two cities. Not, it wasn't that they were, were destroyed because that, that judgment spread beyond Sodom and Gomorrah somehow without God purposing it. No, every judgment of God is with purpose. And yet we must not think of God just as an austere God that, delights in the destruction of sinners, and that's why he does what he does. No, he acts as a just judge, and according to his justice. The only reason that sinners aren't destroyed, ultimately, is because the Lord Jesus Christ paid that sin debt on their behalf. If he spared not his son, but delivered him up, that he might redeem and justify those sinners he's purposed to save, do not think that it's of any consequence for God then to render his judgment in casting sinners to hell. But he always does so with warning. That's what we see here. How many years had this gone on? Over 200 years. And the Lord is letting them know the end is near. He said, I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man. The Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. Here the Lord is showing the difference between how he acts 
as God and how men act. Men act out of vengeance. They hold back their anger for a while and then they react. That's not God. When he says, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger, I will not destroy Ephraim for I am God and not man. He's acting always according to his will and to his purpose. They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion when he shall roar. Then the children shall tremble from the west. There's different ways in which God deals with nations, sometimes in mercy, but other times like a lion roaring and causes sinners to tremble as they look at his judgments being performed and accomplished even when it's from afar. They shall tremble as a bird out of Egypt and as a dove out of the land of Assyria, and I will place them in their houses, saith the Lord. Ephraim compasseth me about with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruled with God and is faithful with the saints. It wasn't that Judah was any better. They were just in a better place because God had purposed to preserve them because God had purposed that his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, should come through that lineage, the Lion of Judah. But when God roars, when God speaks, when he, that's the, the view we have here. Wherever God is purpose, has purposed to speak and to draw sinners, he'll draw them and he'll place them in their houses. So this isn't just some wide sweeping justice. God has his remnant. He knows those that are his. In all of his judgment, he exercises that and promises that he would preserve Judah. That's what he says, but Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints, the, those that he has purposed to save in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in his judgments, there's still mercy. And that's the only reason any are saved, because of his mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would Bless it to our hearing and cause us to see that we deserve nothing but your judgment and condemnation, but that you have purpose, mercy, and grace toward those sinners that you have chosen in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and for whom he came into this world and bore their sin death, that you might be a just God and Savior. I pray that you would make us mindful even as we continue our time of worship. It's only by your mercies and grace that we're not destroyed. And we give you the thanks and praise in our dear Savior's name.